Okay, so let's look at some problems. Here's a trivial one. At equilibrium, you walk up and you have a container and you find these things. And you know it's at equilibrium because you've waited for the rest of your life and the concentrations have stopped changing. And so now you know at equilibrium, these are the concentrations. And we'll look at what is Kc for this expression. Okay, Kc is the concentration of the products, NH3 squared over the concentration of H2 cubed over the concentration of N2. And these are, of course, the equilibrium concentrations of all of these. So if I only knew the equilibrium concentrations, I could find the value of K. And lo and behold, I'm given the equilibrium concentration, so I can just plug them in. So this is 0.2 squared, and again, it's 2 molar, but I don't put the 2 molar in because I've divided by the standard concentration of 1 molar over hydrogen, 0.1 cubed, times nitrogen, which is 0.2. And if I plug all that in and run through the math, I discover this comes out to be 200. And so now, for that, I, I don't actually have to do anything. There's no looking at a rice table. There's no figuring anything out. I am given the values at equilibrium. I plug them into the mass action expression. I get the equilibrium constant. Now, let's imagine instead, I, I was given that the equilibrium constant was 200. That was known to me. And I was given the equilibrium constant of H2 and the equilibrium constant of N2. And then I was told the initial concentration of ammonia. So when I have a little zero here, that means that's my initial concentration. So how am I going to find things out here? Now what do I know? I can, I can put in all the things I know. At equilibrium, I know H2, so that's 0.2 molar. And nitrogen, I know, is 0.4 molar. And then I'm given this one, that this is 0 0.1. And now I'm asked to find the rest. So what am I going to do? Well, the first thing I can look at is my mass action expression and thinking about the equilibrium constant. So again, this is NH3 squared over H2 cubed over N2. And it's equal to 200. And I know this one, and I know this one, so I can just solve for that. And if I rearrange this, I discover that NH3 comes out to be 0.8. Okay, how did I know that? I took the equilibrium value here, plugged it in. I took the equilibrium value here, plugged it in. I rearranged and took a square root. So that means I now know this one. I can stick it in here and say this is 0.8. Now, I also know the change that has occurred for all of these. So to do this, I just have to pick some definition of change. And what I'm going to say is because this is one mole and these are the reactants, I'm going to say that I'm losing 0.x moles of uh, nitrogen. For every mole of nitrogen, I lose 3x moles of hydrogen and I gain plus 2x moles of ammonia. Again, the change is always related to my stoichiometric coefficients because the reaction occurs based on those numbers of moles. Now I know everything because I know what x is because 0.1 plus 2x has to be 0.8. And so that tells me that x has to equal 0.35. And so if x is equal to 0.35, that, let me, that lets me just fill in the rest of the chart. Let's look at a slightly more difficult problem. And this is a typical sort of equilibrium problem. And a typical sort of equilibrium problem is the following. I know the equilibrium constant, and I know what I start with. These zeros here are telling me my initial concentrations. And so I have 0.2 molar hydrogen, 0.2 molar nitrogen, and no ammonia to begin with. What are the concentrations at equilibrium? That's the way the problem usually works. And so here again, I can write down my expression. It's the equilibrium concentration of ammonia. It's the equilibrium concentration of h it's the equilibrium concentration of N2. And it, it, when it's K, it's always the equilibrium concentration, even when I'm lazy and don't write it. 
So now I can put down my initial concentrations. This is 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and 0. And then I can think about my change. And again, I get to choose. I can make it anything I want, but I am choosing to make it minus x. And then based on that, I now know the other changes. This one has to be three times as large and in the same direction. If nitrogen is going down in concentration, hydrogen is going down in concentration. And then ammonia is going up in concentration. And then equilibrium, I just add my initial and my change. So I get 0 0.2 minus 3x, 0 0.2 minus x, and 0 plus 2x is 2x. Equilibrium concentration of H2, plug it into the expression. Equilibrium constant of N2, plug it into the expression. Equilibrium constant of NH3, plug it in the expression. What do I get? Well, NH3 is 2x squared. Hydrogen is 0 0.2 minus 3x cubed. And 0 0.2 minus x is equal to 200. And all we have to do now is solve for x. And if we solve for x, we'll know the concentrations everywhere. Um, and it's about this point everybody starts to freak out and says, oh my god, you can't, you can't do it. It's just too complicated. It's really horrible. Give me a break. It's not hard at all. It's just algebra. All right? This is a big, nasty equation. It's just a polynomial, though. There's nothing to do but math. And there's a million programs in the world that you could find on the web that would do this for you. You could go to Wolfram Alpha, you could have a fancy calculator, so on and so forth. It is just math. That said, this is not a math class. And so we're not going to spend hours and hours and hours and hours learning how to solve polynomials. What do you need to know? You need to know how to set this problem up. Because after that, it's just math. And if your life depended on it, you could do it. But you will not be solving quartic equations on exams. You will not be solving very complicated polynomials for homework. But you should realize that you could. It's really, really not that hard. So what would we have to do? We'd just have to multiply this whole mess out and solve for x. And we would get some I don't know, it looks like a x to the fourth equation, which would give us four roots, and it would turn out that only one of those solutions would be physically possible. So let's look at a quick question. For the following reaction, what's the value for the change in H2? So I've given you some initial amounts. And again, here we have a new reaction. I've got this balanced equation. And I want to know what's the change in H2O. So that's this one here. Based on the fact that I'm losing, or I have a change of minus 2x of my ethane, C2H6. So now you're going to think about it and then enter in an answer. And then immediately you're going to say, oh, oh, well, if this one's going down to losing two moles. For every two moles of ethane that I lose, I gain six moles of water. And so if this is minus 2x, the other one has to be plus 6x. Let's look at a different question. For the following reaction, what's the equilibrium value for CO2? So now I need to think about what is this. So if I'm going to do that, I need to sort through what are the changes. So if this is defined as minus 2x, and again, you could pick it as anything. You could pick it as minus 35y, if that made sense to you. It's just easiest to use a simple definition, which is the number of moles changing based on the stoichiometric coefficients. So for every two moles of this that react, seven moles of this react, minus 7x, and you form four moles of CO2 and six moles of water. Then at equilibrium, what do you have? You have the sum of these. And so the answer is, is that at equilibrium, I get 1.8 plus 4x. Okay, 
Now, that's a lot of just playing around with race tables and realizing the importance of being able to do the stoichiometry. Now, let's just think about some chemical reactions. Here's a reaction, very important reaction in the world. Water, liquid water, turns into hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas. And my question is, do you think the value of this equilibrium constant reaction at room temperature is extremely small, extremely large, or approximately one? So now you're going to pause, you're going to gather those around you who are thinking about these things, and you're going to have a little conversation, and you say, well, what do you think? I don't know. I think it could be really big because, or whatever you're going to do, think about it. Just take two seconds, think about it. I hope, I hope, I hope you have arrived at the answer that the equilibrium constant is very, very small. Why? This reaction favors the reactants. How do I know that? Because I happen to know that the oceans, which cover the vast majority of the surface of the planet that we live on, are made of liquid water. And that last I checked, they were not bubbling up with hydrogen and oxygen gas spontaneously. And the reason is that this reaction favors the liquid water side. Why does it do that? It turns out that the free energy of two moles of liquid water is incredibly low compared to the free energy of two moles of hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And so given a choice, everything will move to free energy, lowest free energy, and this is the low free energy side. And so everything is dominated by this end. And that means the equilibrium constant is much, much less than 1. Products divided by reactants comes out to be less than 1. Um, now you're going to say, oh, 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 but water is pure liquid, and so you're dividing by 1. So it's products divided by nothing. And I'm going to tell you that it's the partial pressures of these two, and that when you look at the partial pressures of those two, they're going to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly small numbers. Even if you did it in concentrations, they'll be incredibly small concentrations. So even if it's not that you're dividing by a big number, the, the actual number for the products could be very, very, very small. Okay, so what did we learn today? Um, very important to remember, reactions don't always go 100% to products. They do a lot of times, but then we don't talk about equilibrium. So there are many reactions which come to some equilibrium, and we have present at equilibrium some reactants and some products. We learned how to write down a mass action expression, and that in fact the the concept of an activity varied depending upon the phase. And then we looked at the extent of a reaction using the equilibrium constant. So k much greater than 1 or k greater than 1. This was something that favored the products. And k less than 1. This was something that favors the reactants. So with that, uh, we will pick up with these things on Tuesday and talk a little bit about free energy.